Okay, welcome. I'm Sally Land, the resident son, dear Deirdre Agony Aunt, and I am super excited today because I'm joined by the lady who gave her name to the famous column, Deirdre Sanders. Welcome, Deirdre. Thank you so much, Sally. It's just wonderful to be here. Oh, it's fantastic to have you here in the studio after a couple of years of not seeing you. Just nearly, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah. it's great. Yeah, Yeah, really good to be with you. Now, I think most of our readers will know that you retired from The Sun about a year and a quarter ago. Yep, that's right. Yeah. So would you tell us what you've been, been working on recently? Uh, well, I'm on this morning um, with Philip and Holly on Wednesdays and with Alison and Dermot usually on alternate Fridays. And that actually keeps me amazingly busy. I mean, it's really good. Just as at The Sun, it was always so important to me, and I know it's important to you, that we reply to everybody individually and we follow up with people who are having really, really difficult problems. And this morning has got the same ethos and I just love it. So when I come off air, you know, it's not just doing three people quickly on air. When I come off air, I'll ring them back very often, ring up anybody who hasn't got on air. Then there's a counsellor there that I can pass on who'll pick up the cases and we follow them through if they've got really serious, long lasting problems. So it's just a great place to work. And as I say, it's such a similar atmosphere and attitude to dear Deirdre it's lovely yeah that's fantastic because it is that duty of care isn't it that's so important for every single person who writes in I really think it matters Mm. and that was always one of the things I was so proud of at the sun because unless things have changed radically we were the only paper who was actually offering that individual answering service and really following up on serious cases and I just think that's what the readers respond to because they're not silly you know they know when they're being exploited and when they're being genuinely supported yeah exactly absolutely every single person gets a response and also a timely response the counselors make sure that they answer within a day when it's a working day yeah i know yeah. it's absolutely brilliant yeah. it's just it's also it's lovely for me to see that all carrying on yeah without, without me having the day-to-day responsibility yeah well you put a brilliant system in place and what a legacy so yeah um i wanted to ask you Going back to 40, 41 years ago now, when you first started in the role, how exactly did the role of becoming Dear Deirdre come about? Well, I was on Woman's Own magazine and I was actually a consumer journalist then. Um, And then I moved to the Daily Star when it had just started and we did a 50-50 column there, half consumer and half emotional problems and then you quickly realize that actually in terms of you know people respond to the emotional problems so much more and then so when I came over to the sun I was basically I was headhunted over the sun and it just became initially it was just I think it was asked Deirdre or something then we realized that dear Deirdre just worked so well as a title and it just grew like topsy so it started off being something like half a page once a week and then it became half a page twice a week then it became a page twice a week and then we filled in the days in between until it ended up being a page every day of the week and then when we had the sun on Sunday as well it became page seven days a week as you well know. <laughs> yes, it's quite an operation, isn't it? It's a it? lot of work, but it's very rewarding. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you must have seen the problems that readers, and listeners write in about evolve over time, over a 40 year period. I, I think sometimes it's less than people expect because actually human behaviour, when you think about it, evolves over decades, hundreds of thousands of years. So actually... Mm. The big problems, you know, commitment in relationships, communication, loneliness, worries about our children, you know, they're all very, very similar. So there's a, there's a bedrock of stuff which is absolutely the same, I would say, but the massive change that I did see happen during my years as an agony aunt was the advent of the internet. Yes. You know, when the internet came, things up till that point, I said to people, oh, no, nothing much is changing. And then suddenly, my goodness, it really has changed because, okay, you've got the same human dynamics, but the opportunity for people, you know, that so if you start with children, children can be on their phone or on a screen in their bedroom. So parents have got no way the same, I don't even want to use the word control, but they've got no way the same real insight into what their children's lives are like. You know, you used yeah. to be able to rely on the fact that if your child was in their bedroom, they were in their bedroom, they were alone, they were safe, they could be reading a book, they might watch television, but that was as extreme as it could get. Now, 
anybody could be chatting to them online, you know, and you really need to keep the lines of communication open with children. Similarly with partners, you know, they can be in the same house, be in the same room, but both be on their phones communicating with very, very different people. So a whole, I feel as though we're a bit in the wild west of it all. Yeah. And we haven't yet really evolved the social restrictions and ways of, and honesty and ways of communicating with one another and agreeing boundaries that yeah. we're going to need to do long term so that it becomes, you know, it's a wonderful thing, the internet. It's absolutely fantastic we have access to all this information and communication. But we need to work out a better balance with our relationships. Yeah, yeah. And our safety. Yeah, because as you say, you often just do not know what world that person is inhabiting when they're on their phone. And then sometimes in a couple, one has a very different attitude. So, you know, some people think that actually flirting with someone online doesn't matter because Mm. it's not IRL, it's not in real life. Mm. Their partner may feel very differently about that. And today they they feel a really deep emotional and sexual betrayal. Mm. You know, and until people have really learned how to communicate about this and be honest and agree and share agreed boundaries... It's yeah. just going to cause endless problems. Yeah, what what constitutes betrayal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that yeah. agreement. Mm. Thank you. Well, I think we can probably start with our first letter, which is sadly about a couple who lost their baby daughter and the mother is starting to feel estranged from the father. Dear Deirdre, I wrote to you when our beautiful little girl died. My husband and I fell apart. I was so overwhelmed with grief and hurt, I sent you an email. I'm 29 and met my husband at uni. He's my age and we've always been best of friends, as well as now husband and wife. Our gorgeous daughter was born three years ago. Our lives felt complete and everything was perfect, but she didn't thrive and it turned out she had a rare heart condition. She went through gruelling operations and the hospital was fantastic. She was a fighter and unbelievably brave. We did our best to stay positive for her sake, but in the end the struggle was just too great. She died aged just 11 months and our hearts were broken. My life was in tatters and instead of drawing me and my husband together, losing our little girl seemed to drive us apart. My husband withdrew into himself and focused on his job. Just when I needed him most, he wasn't there for me, nor would he let me comfort him. I was missing my husband on top of the anguish of losing my daughter. I felt so lonely and turned to you for help. Your reply came quickly and helped me to feel that I wasn't alone. You helped me to realise it was an understandable reaction for my husband to distance himself from those he loved most. That by concentrating on work, he was keeping away from people and situations that reminded him so painfully of our little girl. You also told me about Compassionate Friends, a support group for parents who have lost a child, and they were wonderful. You wrote to me several times over the following months to see how I was getting on. It hasn't been easy, but your kindness helped me to hang on when I was at my lowest ebb. My husband and I started on getting on better, and I've realised that our marriage is still strong. To make our life complete again, we've now had a baby girl, and we've called her Joy. We still think of our sister every day, but we're completely in love with Joy, and she has brought so much happiness back to our lives. It's wonderful to be a family again. So, Deirdre... You must feel a sense of pride when you hear that. It's such a moving story, isn't it? And um, I I mean, for one thing, I just want to say I'm so glad that there is an organisation like the Compassionate Friends because their their motto, if you're going to call it that, is no death so sad. And I think no matter how understanding and sympathetic and supportive we try to be, I think parents who have been bereaved, who have lost a child, just feel you cannot understand the scale of that loss unless you've been there. And the great thing about the Compassionate Friends is that it's an organisation for but also of bereaved parents. Mm. If you speak to someone on the counselling line there, you know, they will have themselves lost a child so they really know how you feel. And I think that is so just so wonderful that they're there. And yes, I that's when I am so proud that we do stay in touch so we could support um, that bereaved mother through a really, really difficult journey. I mean, it, it is, it's perhaps particularly men, but, you know, some women do it as well and they withdraw into themselves. Mm-hmm. They can't 
really feel close to the people they love because when they've lost someone they love that much they feel as if they're exposing themselves to the, to even more pain if they if they risk being close to the people they love so it is an understandable reaction but obviously people need support through that process and it's just wonderful that for that couple it worked out so happily and they did manage to um, understand one another better communicate again and then have their little baby joy yeah and what a gorgeous name for, yes, them, for the second absolutely daughter. Yes, perfect. absolutely perfect. Yes, and I think that is, it is interesting that you helped her understand her husband's reaction and really enabled her to see that he wasn't pulling away from her for the sake of pulling away. It was I think protection. A, lo- a lot of our job is about helping the people who write to us. It's not just saying, oh, there, there, that's awful for you. It's trying to give them some insight into why this person they think is behaving so unfeelingly or wrongly, whatever it is, you know, why they might be behaving like that, because that then helps them communicate better. It opens up the path yeah. and for them to start talking to one another again and feeling close again. Yeah, it's that wider understanding, isn't mm. it? And compassionate friends are fantastic for parents who lose a child, as you just explained. But for anybody who loses someone close to them, then there's also cruise, cruise. cruise bereavement who are absolutely fantastic, they aren't are. they? Yeah, they are absolutely brilliant. I think it's when they've got the helpline there. And sometimes people do have to wait because they can get quite busy. But I always say to people, if you are told you've got to wait for counselling, get yourself on the list because that time will pass amazingly quickly and if you don't get yourself on the list then you know it'll never come get yourself on the list and your day will come and you you will get that understanding support yeah thank you that's really important to say isn't it when people often feel they're in crisis they want that appointment the next day yeah it doesn't mean if you can't have it the next day that it's not worthwhile. No, absolutely. It is worth waiting. And we had experience in my own family because my husband lost his dad when he was only 11. And that came back to bite him, weirdly enough, during the big financial crisis of 2008-9 because I think suddenly the world felt out of control again in the same way it had when he was a child. And he had some... Ber- Believe, you know, bereavement counselling then, though it was, what, 40, 50 years further on. So it's never too late. Yeah, it can lie dormant, can't it? Mm. Mm. Thank you. I think we're going to go move on to our second letter now. now this is from this is from a mum who had started to look at the internet late at night. She and her husband had taken on way too much debt and they were really struggling with their own relationship. She ended up hooking up with a very rich man and had a, a sexual fling with him. And as a consequence, she and her husband hit rock bottom. Um, So. Dear Deirdre, an evening of champagne and sex with a wealthy man I met over the internet nearly wrecked my marriage, but your advice saved everything. My husband and I are both 32 and had been married for six years when we hit a rough patch. We'd bought a big house in the country. It cost us far more upkeep than we estimated. We had money problems and started arguing much more. I couldn't sleep because of all the worry and took to sitting up until the early hours going on the internet where I met an older man. He had loads of money and seemed great fun. We emailed several times a week for a month or so and then he suggested that we meet up. We arranged a date at a very upmarket hotel midway between us. We had a fabulous evening with wonderful food and champagne and everything. He had booked himself a room for the night so we went up to his room afterwards. We had more champagne in his bedroom and then we had sex. He paid me so much attention and made me feel really special and wanted. I drove home in a trance. I had fallen head over heels. After that, he ignored my emails, but I couldn't get him out of my head. My husband began to suspect something and things between us hit rock bottom. I emailed you because I was desperate. Your reply helped me to see my lover for what he was, a user with problems of his own. You pointed out that money worries can drive a wedge between the happiest of couples and told us how to get advice to sort that out. We moved to a more manageable house and got ourselves out of that mess. The best advice from you was to give our marriage a fair chance and your leaflet about looking after yourself and your relationship showed us how. We are now stronger than ever. We have vowed that if we ever have problems in the future, we shall work through them together and I know I will never be so stupid again. Thank you. Deirdre, it's a scenario that we see regularly, isn't it? Just about every day, don't we? Yeah. I mean, it's heartwarming that they have come come through that. I think it's so easy 
I mean, I've been married for something like 52 years. It is hard work. It certainly yes. has its hard work times. And it's it's so easy. And particularly, as we're saying, with the internet offering this endless temptation to mm. look elsewhere, it's so easy to think that the answer lies elsewhere, that, you know, there's going to be some, you know, knight in shining armour or, or a wonderful damsel who is going to come along and rescue us. And it's all going to be wonderful. It's going to be like the sort of teenage romance. Real life is real life. Um, and the, it's really important, I think, if you've been in a, quite a committed relationship, is to give that a fair chance and mm. to try and work through the, the difficulties and the snags together and to start communicating again and not blame one another. It's so easy when some, you know, you're not feeling happy enough to blame the other person, try and pin it all on them, when actually probably at least 50% your own thing, issue, fault, to sort out own responsibility. Um, and I think it's really great when people realise that. Yeah. I mean, and that other guy clearly was very uncaring. I mean, he, you know, she said, you know, she thought she'd fallen head over heels in love. She hadn't. She'd had, you know, a great, you know, evening, a bit like fulfilling a fantasy of champagne and sex. There was no real feelings involved there as such. You know, she was like imagining herself actually, in quotes, in love. And actually she'd had her head turned. Luckily, when she got home, you know, she woke up to it and she had a husband as well who was prepared to work with her on the issues and that she started tackling them together, which is just wonderful. And I think they didn't actually go for counselling. But I mean, I also would say to people, it's really worthwhile. People are often scared of counselling, but it's much more accessible these days because you can get it online. So you haven't even got to leave the home often. That was one good thing about COVID that it really opened up the whole counselling profession to the idea of doing a lot of work online you know, on Zoom um, and it's made it much more accessible for people and it really can help to have someone who's not involved in the situation who isn't your mum no matter how loving she is or you know or friend it's really important to have someone who is outside the situation who can just hear you both and reflect you both back to one another which can often really help you understand one another a lot better yeah yeah, and you mentioned now there are so many counselling services online and Tavistock relationships who we recommend do provide online. Yeah, I think they're brilliant. Counselling, yeah. don't they? Yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah, and it's, we, we always say, don't we, talk to your partner, tell them about how you're feeling rather than pointing the finger, which puts people on the back foot. But I think it's, we often underestimate how difficult that can be talking and actually being honest and actually listening to the truth so you have to be brave don't you, you do. to take and we've also learned well there's a lot of interesting research around so one thing can actually help to go out for a walk together it's been really oh. found now and it's the same with like children sometimes you find your child opened up to you and you're driving them somewhere walking or driving along where you're not actually having to stare into one another's eyes can be much more comfortable and can help people start opening up to one another. So if you're feeling very stuck, suggest to your partner you go for a walk together. You know, it's better than best not drive with that sort of conversation in case it gets heated, but go for a walk together. And often you will find you talk through things much more comfortably than trying to sit staring at one another over the kitchen table. But whatever's best for you, the main thing is talk please talk and also I realised if you can't talk to one another at least try you know with a friend or with one of the many helping organisations out there you know if need be talk to the Samaritans for example they're always there they'll always pick up the phone they'll always talk to you you don't have to be suicidal but they can be a very good reflective listening ear yeah I love that advice about going for a walk because it's less confrontational, isn't exactly. it, than facing one another. Mm. Perhaps that's why most parents tell their children about the birds and bees in the car. In the car, exactly. All the stories <laughs> yeah. seem to be in the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll move to the third letter now. Um, uh, this This letter came from a listener who's separated from his wife and the ex-wife is making access really, really difficult with the daughter. He says, Dear Deirdre, I managed to have my daughter for Christmas Day for the first time this year. I want to say thanks, as it was you that gave me the motivation. I love my wife, but she cheated on me, and I had to leave her in the end. She was difficult about me seeing her daughter from the start. Our daughter is seven, I'm only 38, and my ex is 32. 
She had lots of different partners after we split up and I was worried about the effect on my daughter of all these different men going in and out of the home. I said something about it to my ex and then she made it even harder for me to see my daughter and she said there was no way I could have her for Christmas, any Christmas. You helped me see that I shouldn't just accept this and be a doormat. You suggested that I take it to court and get advice from families need fathers. It's worked and my daughter and I had a lovely Christmas. Thank you. That is such it's just, a lovely letter. It is It is absolutely lovely. Um, it's really tragic. I think it's one of the major tragedies that we see going on around us that so many couples really struggle to communicate calmly and openly and constructively about their children after they split up. And this goes both ways. You know, there's lots of guys who are just horrible and still try to be maybe controlling or actually just walk away and if they can't have the marriage and the relationship and the home they just walk away from their kids but there are equally there are some mothers who it's as if once the marriage is broken up or the relationship is broken up they just want to get that guy out of their lives and they make it really hard but children need both their parents in fact families need fathers I mean they're still called FNF but actually they they actually now say they're because children need both parents um, and if it's at all possible, unless a parent is abusive and actually damaging, children do need both parents. You know, men and women, mums and dads, they bring different qualities to children's lives and children are modelling themselves in different ways on both their parents. And it's also very important that parents model to the children how you sort out differences of opinion and feelings and difficulties constructively together and calmly and really work together so it's great that you know that that dad finally did manage to get to see his daughter and I think it wasn't just Christmas day it was regularly and by and large these days you know the courts are very supportive of that they will really try to make sure that is the outcome for the children's sake and they'll take the children's feelings into consideration you know but the parents really have to be prepared to sort of make their case to the court clearly and also as you will know we really recommend mediation yeah. national family mediation is there and mediation can really help a couple who are just arguing and can't sit and talk constructively together even if they don't want counseling they're not going to try and save their relationship but mediation can help them make good choices for the children and around the children and also maybe about things like property as well but above all it's children who suffer so much when the parents break up yeah, it's it's heartbreaking, really, when you see a parent or both parents using the children as weapons yeah. to get at the other parent. Yeah, it's um, really true. I mean, I suppose I always put a caveat on that I don't believe in couples staying together just, in quotes, for the sake of the children. You should only stay together if you can stay together constructively and lovingly because otherwise you, your children just grow up in a, an atmosphere of sort of silent warfare that which can be equally damaging for them. So it's important. But I really believe in working hard on your relationship. For, if you have children, you really should try to save it, make it a really good one, work constructively together. If you can't, then end it, but end it in a positive, loving way, bearing in mind your children's needs all the way through and putting them first. They really, you know, they're, they're, they're so vulnerable in these situations. You know, they've only got you and your partner to protect them. Yeah, we know, don't we, that children's self-esteem does suffer if they don't have a relationship with both parents. Absolutely. So. It really eats into the poor little souls. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to move on to a couple of your favourite letters mm. next. Uh, the first one is my personal favourite, I've got to admit. This one is um, when you essentially helped, helped a couple with their, with their sex relationship and in turn, obviously, their relationship. Dear Deirdre, I've had my first orgasm after 16 years of marriage and it's thanks to your advice. My husband's wonderful, but I've never felt satisfied by our sex life and had been tempted to have an affair. But all that changed after reading your leaflet, Women in Orgasm. My husband and I discussed and practised some of the techniques and discovered new pleasures. It's a wonderful feeling for me, and I'm pleased for my husband too, as he is able to satisfy me at last. Thank you. 
I did, Tree. You got a phenomenal response to this letter, it's didn't absolutely you? Brilliant. We got 10,000 requests for that leaflet. Wow. Came back in instantly. And this was this is back in the days of posts, so people had to actually write in. But the funny corollary of that, which I'm not sure you're aware of, is that they'd actually, by mistake, left the, left the um, address of my office off the column that day. Oh. So all these 10,000 letters flooded into the paper saying they wanted my leaflet. And the post postroom just sent them through to the first thing they could address they could think, which was that where they sent out the bingo cards. So, so <laughs> later readers were sent bingo cards, and I got these people writing back in saying, "I asked for your leaflet on women and orgasm, and you sent me a bingo card. What am I supposed to do with that?" <laughs> that that is not going to hit the same heights, is it? <laughs> Line, <laughs> not exactly. But I mean, also they did then get sent the leaflet, and it's great. And I mean, it is amazing that even these days, you know, you'd think that that might have all just been like something historical it's still an issue yeah um, between couples oh yeah and women being really satisfied sexually and that the sort of sex that a couple are having being the right sort of sex for them it's still a big issue and perhaps I even sometimes get the feeling it's been made worse because actually young particularly young men they're they're so exposed to, to pornography these days because again it's on the internet and those those videos and they, they do not show the way to give a woman the greatest pleasure by and large. Yeah. So they've got completely the wrong idea. So it's probably even more important to make sure that couples really understand what makes for great sex for women. Yeah, and actually having realistic expectations about what to look for in a partner and, Absolutely. and how to have a good yeah. sexual relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a saying that, that foreplay starts with doing the washing up. Oh, yeah, and I... the dishwasher <laughs> every time. <Yeah. laughs> You're so right. Um, yes, and I, I often think that people think there's the sex advice that we give is, is sort of a trivial, humorous part of the job. But it's so crucial to good solid relationships yeah i think it's, it is absolutely vital i mean you know there are there are there are some couples to whom sex is not important but they are they are a small minority they really are and so it's not trivial it's just that we we're still raising young people who find it embarrassing to talk about and you know i, we, I always used to say and i'm sure you say the same that you know if you're if you're close enough to have sex, then you're close enough to talk about it and you yeah. should be able to share with one another actually what makes you feel good, what doesn't make you feel good. And there's good stuff, basic sensate focus exercises, which people enjoy much more than they think they're going to. It sounds all a bit cold, cut and dry, but it's not at all. And it is a really good way of exploring one another and finding out you know, what your individual responses are and what is going to make you feel yeah, good. Yeah, How to please one another. Yeah. And I think that's what Dear Deirdre offers is that non-judgmental place where you can ask anything. You'd be too embarrassed to ask your best friend down the pub. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, sa it's a safe space. I yeah. think it's very, it's safe and it's, yeah, exactly non-judgmental mm. and that's such an important part of it. Yeah. Thank you. Now, the final letter I know is dear to your heart in, in many ways. Um, this this came from a, a listener who who sadly was raped as a teenager and it was with your help years later that she got the justice she deserved. Dear Deirdre, thanks to you, a man who raped me as a teenager has been brought to justice. When I was 14, I got a job delivering newspapers and helping behind the till in our local corner shop. It was OK at first and I was glad to be able to earn some money, but the owner started coming on to me and made me feel uncomfortable. He was in his 40s. I would try and avoid being in the back room with him, but one day he cornered me and he raped me. He said it was my fault for being such a sexy little thing and wearing a short skirt. He said I better keep quiet about it as no one would believe that I had not led him on. I was so shocked and ashamed and at first I told no one, but bottling it up made me more and more miserable. One day I broke down in tears at school, pulled it all out to a teacher as they called the police. He was arrested for questioning, but that was it. My word against his. It went no further. I saw this guy sometimes when I was back in my old area of town. 
I was over the trauma, but wrote to you wondering, in the light of the hashtag MeToo movement, whether I could get the police to look at my case again, though I'm 30 now, so I wasn't sure if it would lead to anything. You sent me your leaflet called Have You Been Raped, with all the information I needed, and wrote to me several times to see how I was getting on. I called my local rape crisis centre and they supported me in going back to the police. This led to my case being reinvestigated and the police tracking down the witnesses they'd never bothered to contact all those years ago. They pressed charges against him for rape and indecent assault against a minor. It went to court and he was found guilty. He's been sentenced to 12 years. I can't begin to explain how I'm feeling. At best, I was hoping for an apology from the police for the shambolic way it was originally handled. I want to thank you and your team for pointing me in the right direction to achieve this result and giving me a push when I felt overwhelmed. I feel lighter than ever and I'm so happy to close this chapter for good. Thank you. I can see why you're proud of that. It was just great. And I you know, I am so proud of our service that we did we stayed in touch with her. It was it is a struggle. I mean, we hear more and more don't we, about how hard it is to bring rape cases for the victim. I mean, it, it, it's really tough. It's a difficult process. Um, so I was really glad we helped support her through that. And it's really, it just shows how attitudes in at least some police forces have changed. It was great that whereas they didn't really pursue it before, this time they took it seriously, they found the witnesses, you know, and it was re- it was really taken seriously and pursued and, and they got a conviction. So that was really good. And I think I'm not really keen on the term closure about because I don't think issues do ever really close for you but I think there's a real sense of vindication for someone who's been raped when justice is seen to be done and there is a very clear message out there really helps them know it was not my fault you know it was the responsibility of the rapist they did wrong and now now justice is going to be served so it's very very satisfying to actually help someone through that process yeah and that's that's a theme that we hear from a lot of sexual assault victims that they do blame themselves even though clearly it is not their responsibility absolutely and i mean like she was like the her rapist told her her skirt was too short yeah there's still all this around isn't there oh yeah. you know you, well, you shouldn't have had a drink you shouldn't have been out on the dark street you shouldn't have been doing this you shouldn't have been doing that oh you should flag down a bus i mean that ridiculous one after the yeah. murder of sarah everard so it is really good to see the responsibility being put firmly on the shoulders of the person who deserved it Yeah, thank you. And also what is fantastic and you've highlighted there is the way that the service gives continuing support to people who need it. The councillors do check in with those those listeners regularly and helping them over the line. Yeah, they? it's absolutely great. I love it. And we said, we, I'm sure you do the same. You start actually mm. mark things. You know, this, this person needs to be contacted in a couple of weeks or a month, whatever yeah. it is. So really stay on it until we're really happy yeah. that they're, they're in a much better place and, you know, at, at, a, at a stage where they can actually cope Yeah. Um, and, a, and have found maybe more local support, whatever it is they need, but they are in a much better place after, after writing to dear Deirdre. Yeah. Thank you, Deirdre. I wanted to ask you, as I take on the baton, if you had a piece of advice for me. Um, well, I'd hesitate to give you. As you know, I mean, I was really keen for you to, to, to be the person who succeeded um, as Thank editing Dear Deirdre. So I'm really, I'm really happy about that. I would say the thing I probably learned is it is quite important to carry on um not so much doing some work on yourself, but act, but you know making sure that you talk to somebody. Yeah. Um. I used to get quite cross about some other agony aunts who'd be nameless, who would say, you know, they'd be recommended people endlessly to go for counselling. Say, oh, you know, so have you had some counselling? Oh, no, no, you know, it's not not for me. And I think it's really important to carry on finding support for yourself, because actually you are taking on board lots and lots you know thousands of people's problems and you think you can cope and it's all okay and you know what you're doing but actually there is a burden and there is a responsibility in that and it's important that you have someone you check in with every so often to offload some of that and think you know am I am I you know am I handling this right and is that right and is this okay in my life it's really important that you you get some support too I shall take your advice thank you (laughs) um 
I think, yes, you're right, because you need to be in a good place in order to be able to support everybody who's writing in, don't you? You you really Mm. do. And it's like um, professional counsellors, you know, they... I mean, I think any decent counsellor will be having supervision. They will have someone that they're checking in with every so often. And I think the same goes for us. If we're providing a really good service as an agony aunt, there should be someone that we're checking in with to make sure that that we're okay and and that, that how we're helping our readers and viewers and listeners is okay too. It, it just adds to the, the, the safety net for everybody. Thank you. And sadly, I've only got time to ask you one more question. I would like to know if there is one piece of advice you would give anybody listening to us now. What is your, your life motto that you would like to pass on? Um, do you know, I think I'm going to make it two. <laughs> because, well, one is, I think it is, it is share your problems. Sometimes we're in tough situations and you have to be tough through those. But whatever's going on for you in your life, I think it's really important to make sure that you are talking honestly with somebody, whether it's in your own life or it's one of the supporting organisations, at least once a week you have a real offload. I think that's absolutely vital. There's nothing so bad that you can't share it with somebody. And then the other thing is really simple and practical, which is go for a good walk every day. There is so much research now that just shows that going for as brisk a walk you can manage, you know, half, half an hour if you can manage that. But if you have to start with five slow minutes, do that, you know, because you will get a bit faster and be able to walk for a bit longer. And there is so much research shown that it actually really helps emotional, mental and physical health long term, right now, this minute, but then also on through the decades of your life. It's really, really important to do that. That is such a brilliant piece of practical advice. And I often now talk about my dog, Coco, who you know. <laughs> And she she is my therapist. She comes and tells me when I need my walk and off we go every lunchtime. Exactly. Yeah. Dog, that, dogs are very, very good therapists. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Deirdre. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure having you in. And it's been a joy to come. <laughs>